Thank you so much, Councilwoman Hensley. It's so fantastic to see this giant and amazing turnout here tonight for the kickoff of the 13th annual AVID series here at the Des Moines Public Library. The library is really such an important resource here in Des Moines, not only for the free flow of books for everyone, which is a miracle in itself, but also as a gathering place for our community to exchange ideas and to connect with one another. I have to say, my first introduction to Cheryl Stray didn't go quite this well. It happened not long ago, not long after my book came out, on a night that my friend Kelly and I were having a drink down at Django. She comes in all excited. Oh my gosh, she said, you know, like readers do. I have this amazing book, and it blew my mind, and it broke my heart, and I love it so much, and you have to read it right now. Of course, I want to know what it is. And maybe I'm sort of hoping it might be my book. <laughs> well, she says, it's called Wild, and it's by this amazing woman named Cheryl Strayed. And it's the story of how this woman just ditched everything, and she took an incredible journey to get her life into perspective, and I still just can't believe how good it was, and I think I love her so much. <laughs> I just sat there for a minute, and I looked at Kelly. Dude, I said finally, I totally did that. <laughs> I know Kelly said a lot of other things that night, but I don't remember them, because I was really busy pouting. Eventually, though, curiosity got the best of me, and I soon picked up a book called Tiny Beautiful Things, Cheryl Strayed's collection of advice columns that she wrote anonymously as Dear Sugar for the website The Rumpus. I didn't go straight to Wild. It was still a little pouty. <laughs> From the opening pages of Tiny Beautiful Things, Cheryl Strayed's magnanimous, fierce advice to the lonely hearts among us and aren't we all really lonely hearts deep down? It warmed my cold and jealous soul. <laughs> I mean, I was torn down by this woman. I was open-mouthed crying as I was sitting there reading in front of the fireplace to the point that I think I scared my kids. <laughs> Tiny Beautiful Things diffuses wisdom about love, about relationships, and about family that resonates as a pure and unselfish act of sharing and it made this reader feel properly nurtured. Then I moved on to her first novel about a Minnesota family whose matriarch dies suddenly of cancer. It's called Torch. And finally to her nonfiction book, Wild, about her journey in 1995 along the Pacific Crest Trail in search of answers to a life that had gone beyond her control. Wild was chosen by Oprah Winfrey as her first selection for Oprah's Book Club 2.0 an option for film by Reese Witherspoon's production company, Pacific Standard. In these books, I found again and again that same unselfish openness in Cheryl Strayed's writing. It is a form of love, writing like that. And it is the very best work an author can do. And Cheryl Strayed is so good at it. Heartbreakingly good. We are fortunate to have her here tonight to hopefully share just a bit more with us. You may submit your written questions to the author with these little things that are in your programs. Someone will come around and retrieve your questions. Librarian Marcy Baim is tweeting this event, and you can also submit your questions that way with the hashtag DMPLAVID. That's hashtag DMPLAVID to tweet your questions. And now I'm honored and a little bit giddy <laughs> to welcome Cheryl Strayed to the Des Moines Public Library. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming, and I feel so terribly guilty about all of you standing in the back. You all deserve seats. But if it's any comfort, I just, I, I get to watch a lot of TV in hotel rooms these days. And the other day I was in Los Angeles and I turned on the TV and it was this whole show about basically sitting is like the, the end of us. So 
You guys who don't have a seat, you're, you're doing something good for your body. So good for you. So thank you. What a great introduction. Thank you so much. I think you should all immediately go buy Jen's book um, from this lovely independent bookseller over here. Um, because it, it sounds fantastic. It sounds just right up my alley. <laughs> or down my path, I should say. So thank you. It's such an honor to walk into a room and see so many people here to hear a writer talk and about a book. And I, I'm especially honored that it's my, my book. So um, <laughs> thank you. How many of you have read Wild? Whoa, thank you. How many of you haven't read Wild? Shame, shame on you. <laughs> I'm teasing. So I'm going to talk tonight about, mostly about Wild, a little bit about my other books too. And when I go, I'm going to read a little bit from Wild too, but mostly when I go to hear a writer, um, I want to hear the story behind the story. So forgive me if there are any spoilers in my talk. There might be just a couple. Um, the, the big one is I lived. Um, so, <laughs> and, um, and also, if you've already read the book, forgive me if I have to repeat some things and explain some things to the, those who haven't read it. Um, Wild is a, a story of my 1,100-mile hike on the PCT in the summer of 95. Uh, I really decided to hike the, the trail rather uh, impulsively out of a very dark place in my life. I was living in Minneapolis um, and had reached a, a point of... I, what I think of really as the bottom of my life, a point of real despair and sorrow. Um, as those of you who've read the book know that, you know, so much of the journey, you know, there's this hiking boot on the cover, which is, is a kind of like, um, you know, some people pick it up because of the boot. They think it's about hiking. Um, and then they're like, wait a minute, you know, they're bawling their heads off in chapter one. Um, and it really is about, I mean, there's, there's something to the fact that there's one boot there, an orphan boot. Um, because that's really what the story is, is, I think, at its core about, and that is my journey that began on uh, March 18th, 1991, um, the day my mom died of cancer. Um, she was 45. I'm 44 now, so she was only a year older than me, which has just gotten younger and younger um, <laughs> as, as I get older. When she died, I knew she was young, um, but now I'm just blown away about how young she was when she died. She um, went from being a healthy person uh, who we thought had a bad cold to suddenly being a person who had had advanced stage lung cancer. And she died seven weeks uh, to the day after her diagnosis. And it was one of those things. I mean, I know a lot of people, um, you know, probably many, many of you in the room have experienced um, the loss of somebody who was essential to you. And so I know, I know you know, you'll know what I mean when I say, you know, the world ended for me that day that my mom died. Um, there was life as I knew it uh, until that day, and then there was a different life. And I was in the midst anyway of going, of, I was a senior in college. My mom was also a senior in college. Um, we had, I had grown up in northern Minnesota on 40 acres of, of wilderness, essentially. Um, we didn't have indoor plumbing or um, running water or electricity for big chunks of my teenage years, which um, wasn't what I was hoping for, but um, I, we had an outhouse and all of that kind of stuff. And, and when I, um, when I, just, I was always this ambitious kid who, who wanted to be a writer. I, I didn't grow up in a house of, of culture. I didn't know any writers, but I loved to read. My mother always read to me and I knew that I was going to go to college. Nobody talked to me about um, what entail, what applying to college entailed. So I just, on my own, um, I was sent all these brochures and I just lined them up. I thought that you just picked one, like basically based on the brochure. Um, so if any of you are in marketing or PR, you know, that stuff matters. Because um, that's how I picked my college. I looked at the pictures. Um, the one that had the, the kind of least weird looking people was the one I applied to, which was this Catholic private university called St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. I applied there, um, one place, they accepted me. And when they accepted me, they said in their letter, um, one of the benefits, if you should choose to go here, they didn't know that I didn't have a choice, um, that is that your parents and grandparents can go for free. And um, my mother had been a single mother with three kids and had really always sacrificed so much for my siblings. 
and me, and she said jo jokingly, well, I've always wanted to go to college. Maybe I should go with you, um, which I didn't think was funny. <laughs> Would any of you at 17 have volunteered to take your mom to school with you? I don't think there's anyone. Um, but what happened, and so that was my reaction, no way in hell are you going to school with me, mom. Um, but this other voice won out, the truer voice um, within me, the one that's in all of us, the one when you know you're going to do the right thing or, or when you're going to do the wrong thing. And um, in this moment, I just thought, um, okay, I, wanna, I don't want to deny my mother this opportunity. So I said, you can go to college with me under one condition, um, and that is if we should encounter each other on this small campus, um, which we surely will, you cannot acknowledge me or, or register any recognition whatsoever unless I recognize you. It was like I was the queen or something. And, um, <laughs> and she said, that's fine with me. And so we, we went to college together. We both went full time, and it ended up you know, I lived in the dorm on campus and she commuted three hours um, to our house in northern Minnesota. She got her classes so they were a few days a week. She would stay in the Twin Cities and then go home. And after that first year, I was paying for my own um, college education with the help of loans and Pell Grants. And so thank you, taxpayers. You, you helped me get my education. And so St. Thomas was too expensive for me. So I, tra I you know, pretty quickly realized I had to get to a cheaper school. So I transferred to the University of Minnesota, and my mom also transferred to the University of Minnesota. <laughs> and except the great thing is there were two campuses. She went to Duluth near our house, and I went to the Twin Cities. So it came to be that on the Monday of our spring break of our senior year, my mom died. And it was, you know, back to that moment of the world ending. We had not only been um, mother and daughter, we had become in so many ways really, I mean, just even more close through that college journey. I was just starting at that age to see my mom as a person separate from me, which is really a journey what we all go through. We don't, I think, um, really uh, uh, understand our parents as, as individuals separate from, from who we want them to be for us. And so I was just starting to see that when she died. And, um, and also just trying to go about the business of figuring out who I was, um, that we all do in our early 20s. What path am I going to take? I, was, I knew I was going to be a writer, um, but I didn't know how, really how to get there. It was going to entail a lot of um, exploration and adventure. And in my grief, um, you know, not only did I lose my mom, it, it really uh, suddenly uh, exacerbated the fact that I didn't have a dad either. The, the dad I do have was an abusive, tyrannical um, person who, who was mostly not in my life and, and still isn't. Um, but you know, my mother's death suddenly, it just split all of that wide open. And so I felt myself acutely alone in the world. And, and I grieve my mom in ways that, at the beginning, that you hope um, you grieve someone you love, which is with nobility and, and respect and um, I guess, a, a ferocity that's acceptable culturally. Um, and then my mom kept being dead, you know? She kept being dead like a year later and a couple of years later. And, 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 I, and I couldn't bear it. I, I just, um, th that, that sorrow turned inward and I started to really self-destruct. And I was married at the time to someone I loved a lot and who was good to me. And I did um, things that I, I just couldn't sustain that. I did things you're not supposed to do. Um, when you're married to somebody, namely having sex with a whole bunch of other people. Um, and that was, you know, a really, um, it ended up being, you know, it led me in directions that became even more self-destructive. I met a man um, in Portland, Oregon, who introduced me to heroin. And I started doing that. You know, in retrospect, I, the older me looks back at that younger me and sees that moment of, you know, choosing to do this this drug that I know to be, not good for anyone. Um, but in so many ways I was seeking, like I was really seeking a cure actually. And in some ways for a little moment that felt like heroin felt like it was going to be that thing. And, um, and then it wasn't, you know, and then it was, it actually led me to a deeper, harder, darker, uglier place. And so it was at this moment that I had returned to Minneapolis. I was working as a waitress. It was the winter of 94. And there was a blizzard as there often is. Um, <laughs> You guys feel my pain on that, I know. Um, and 
I went to REI, uh, which you know what REI is, yes? Some places don't. In Soho, they don't really know. Um, so I have to ask. I went there to buy a shovel. One of the things about writing about your life is you realize that real life hands you metaphors that if you, you know, that if you put in them into a novel, your writing group would say, you can't be buying a shovel at this moment of your life because you're down and, you know, because that's just too much of a metaphor. But life hands you those metaphors. I needed to dig my truck out of the snow, but really more importantly, I needed to dig myself out of my hole. And I was standing in line waiting to buy this shovel when I looked to the side, I was killing time, and I picked up a book off of a shelf. Um, it was called The Pacific Crest Trail, Volume 1, California. And I'd never heard of the Pacific Crest Trail before. How many of you learned about the Pacific Crest Trail because you read Wild? Awesome. I love that. I love to perform a public service because, <laughs> you know, what's amazing about that trail and all the national scenic trails that we have in this great nation is those, are our, those belong to us. And the people who came before us made sure to protect those wilderness corridors so people like, you know, like knuckleheads like me could just go walk them. And knuckleheads like you too. So if you ever, um, you know, it's just an amazing thing. And I read the back of this book. It was, I just turned it over and read the back of this guidebook. And it said, the Pacific Crest Trail is this national scenic trail that goes from Mexico to Canada through California and Oregon and Washington, up the crest of the Sierra Nevada and the Cascade Range. And I, something in me in that moment, just absolutely that feeling, that true voice I spoke of a moment ago, blossomed. And I knew that I needed to, you know, I just, I, I could, that pair, I was just, oh, the, here's this magnificent thing, this really significant grand thing. And here am I, none of those things, not even close to any of those things, actually feeling at that moment in my life that I'd completely squandered my life, failed to be, um, the woman my mother raised me to be. You know, again, in retrospect, I can see so clearly that I was um, hoping to honor my mother by failing to go on without her. And that would in some way speak to how much I loved her, that I couldn't live without her. But, but now, I mean, I'm a mom now, and I know, you know, what we want our children to do without us is to thrive. And I failed. Um, at least at that moment, I, I had failed. And so I thought, well, maybe if I just do this thing, if I throw myself in the direction of this magnificent thing called the trail that I had not heard of until 30 seconds before, um, you know, maybe, maybe I can write my little ship and sail on. Um, and so I did. I, I spent the next four or five months, um, you know, working double shifts, and every week I'd go into REI with this wad of cash. Um, my tips from waiting tables, and I would say, you know, I'm going to take, I'm going to go about three months backpacking. What do I need? And they're super good at like selling you all this cute stuff, these foldable things and compact backpacking things. And I bought them all. And I sold, I got divorced and I sold my things and I moved, I headed west in my, my truck. And I got myself to the town of, uh, I left my truck in Portland, Oregon, and got myself to the town of Mojave, California, which is about 10 miles away from the trail. And I, put all this stuff on the bed. And it was really a lot of stuff. Um, and I looked at it, and I knew before this moment that I, that I hadn't um, ever gone backpacking. Um, <laughs> but I really remembered it. And like, you know, I don't know, you, am I the only one who like, you know something, but you kind of like glaze over it and pretend not to know something. And, and then, and then you, there's this moment where you, can, you, you actually really know it. And um, almost always when I have that, it entails me being completely screwed. You know, it's like, okay, here we are and I'm, I'm in this. And so I looked at that stuff and I realized I have never gone backpacking before. And um, maybe this, you know, I, I maybe got ahead of myself um, with all of this. But I decided, you know, what could I do? I was there. And so I packed all my stuff up. And, and one of the things, too, that I did, um, which was, now, those of you who haven't read Wild, it's not a how-to book. So um, <laughs> if, if there were a subtitle to the subtitle, it would be what not to do, you know. Um, but so I get all this stuff packed up. And one of the things I had done is, you know, I, I didn't hike the entire trail. I just hiked 1,100 miles of it. And um, so I just very randomly, I knew where I wanted to end up. 
And so wherever that meant that I would begin is just where I began. And I didn't really think about, well, maybe at the beginning, begin in a place that is a little kind of easier stretch of trail because you've never, I mean, you're shooting heroin and having sex with everyone and, instead of training. Um, so, um, so what I did, though, is where I ended up is the Mojave Desert is where I began. And, you know, I'm from the land of 10,000 lakes. Um, turns out hardly any lakes in the Mojave uh, Desert. <laughs> so that first day, I had to carry 24 and a half pounds of water. Okay, so and, and then in addition to everything else, people always ask, well, how much did your pack weigh? The one thing I didn't bring on my trip was a scale. So um, <laughs> I don't know, but I'm going to guess 75 or 80 pounds. Um, it was incredibly heavy. It was like as heavy as the stage, I think. But um, well, anyway, here's what happened when I got the pack packed. I'm just going to read you a little brief passage. Finally, can everyone hear me? Finally, when everything I was going to carry was in the place that I needed to carry it, a hush came over me. I was ready to begin. I looked at my pack. It was at once enormous and compact, mildly adorable and intimidatingly self-contained. It had an animate quality. In its company, I didn't feel entirely alone. Standing, it came up to my waist. I gripped it and bent to lift it. It wouldn't budge. I squatted and grasped its frame more robustly and tried to lift it again. Again, it did not move, not even an inch. I tried to lift it with both hands, with my legs braced beneath me, while attempting to wrap it in a bear hug, with all of my might and my breath and my will, with everything in me, and still it would not come. It was exactly like attempting to lift a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> it looked so cute, so ready to be lifted, and yet it was impossible to do. I sat down on the floor beside it and pondered my situation. How could I carry a backpack more than a thousand miles over rugged mountains and waterless deserts if I couldn't even budget an inch in an air-conditioned motel room? The notion was preposterous, and yet I had to lift that pack. It hadn't occurred to me that I wouldn't be able to. I'd simply thought that if I added up all the things I needed in order to go backpacking, it would equal a weight that I could carry. The people at REI, it was true, had mentioned weight rather often in their soliloquies. <laughs> but I hadn't paid attention. I thought about what I might take out of the pack, but each item struck me as either so obviously needed or so in case of emergency necessary that I didn't dare remove it. I would have to try to carry that pack as it was. I scooted over the carpet and situated myself on my rump right in front of my pack wove my arms through the shoulder straps, and clipped the sternum strap across my chest. I took a deep breath and began rocking back and forth and back and forth to gain momentum until I finally hurled myself forward with everything in me and got myself onto my hands and knees. My backpack was no longer on the floor. It was officially attached to me. It still seemed like a Volkswagen Beetle, only now it seemed like a Volkswagen Beetle that was parked on my back. <laughs> I stayed there for a few moments, trying to get my balance. Slowly, I worked my feet beneath me while simultaneously scaling the metal cooling unit attached to the wall with my hands until I was vertical enough that I could do a deadlift. The frame of the pack squeaked as I rose, it too straining from the tremendous weight. By the time I was standing, which is to say hunching in a remotely upright position, I was holding the vented metal panel that I'd accidentally ripped loose from the cooling unit. I couldn't even begin to reattach it. The place it needed to go was only inches out of my reach, but those inches were entirely out of the question. I propped the panel against the wall, buckled my hip belt, and staggered and swayed around the room. My center of gravity pulled in any direction I so much as leaned. The weight dug painfully into the tops of my shoulders, so I cinched my hip belt tighter and tighter still, trying to balance the burden, squeezing my middle so tightly that my flesh ballooned out on either side which we all know is a fantastic look. <laughs> my pack rose up like a mantle behind me, towering several inches above my head, and gripped me like a vice all the way down to my tailbone. It felt pretty awful, and yet perhaps this was how it felt to be a backpacker. I didn't know. I only knew that it was time to go, so I opened the door and stepped into the light. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. So began, uh, rather uh, inauspiciously, not the way one would, would hope to begin. But, you know, it was, it was all those t um, years, all these years later, a lot of times people will say, okay, you took the hike in 95, um, it, it, the book was published in 2012, I, I, I began writing it in 2008. You know, why did you wait to write the book? Why, why all these years in between? And the, the answer is I didn't wait. You know, Wild is not a report of a hike. Wild is a story about um, what it means to be human, really. And I think that uh, one of the things I felt really clearly was that until I really had something to say about the hike, I wasn't uh, going to write the, the book of the hike. Um, I, I, I didn't, you know, take the biggest hike anyone's ever took or the hardest, grandest adventure. Um, the, the, the deal isn't like, look at me, I did this amazing thing. The deal is, I, I took this trip that was amazing to me, and here's what I have to say about it. You know, the, the, the work of a memoirist, you know, the form gets such a bad rap. And um, I think a lot of people think, well, you have to be a narcissist to write a whole book about yourself. And, you know, I think that when you, when you write a whole book about yourself, if you do it right, it ends up, um, you're mining the self um, in the way that, that any, uh, you know, anyone who's trying to create great literature does, mining the, the, the self to tell a bigger story about um, the human condition, to illuminate what it means to be human. And so until I had something, some perspective on this hike, until it was made manifest in my life, I didn't know what to quite to say about it. And, and I didn't even know that I had much to say about it when I began writing it. But it was when I wrote that scene, which is a comic scene of this heavy backpack that I couldn't get on, um, that I understood that I actually had, you know, the, there was the force of something greater than me that I had to tell. And that was that, that in so many ways, what I was doing in that room is what everyone in this room has had to do several times in, in their life. And if you haven't had to yet, you're going to. And that is figuring out how to bear the unbearable. You know, that you're stuck in a room with a pack you can't lift and you have to lift it and walk out the door. And that was um, really when I wrote the physicality of that scene, just that was a very physical moment. I realized that psychically that was exactly what I was contending with on the trip. It was the, the reason I took the trip is to figure out how to bear the world without my mom. And that was sort of the question at the core of that journey and at the core of, of this book. And I think that I, tr I tried to expand the question, how do, how do we all do that? And um, so when I wrote that scene, I thought, okay, I do have a story to tell. So I went onward into my journey. It was harder um, than I thought it would be, a little bit, a <laughs> little bit. Um, so I'll read a little another snippet just to give you a taste. The, the uh, beginning um, of my hike, this is when I um, first took those first steps. The trail headed east, paralleling the highway for a while, dipping down into rocky washes and back up again. I'm hiking, I thought, and then I'm hiking on the Pacific Crest Trail. It was this very act of hiking that had been at the heart of my belief that such a trip was a reasonable endeavor. What is hiking but walking after all? I can walk, I'd argued when Paul had expressed his concern about my decision to take this trip. I walked all the time. I walked for hours on end in my work as a waitress. I walked around the cities I lived in and visited. I walked for pleasure and purpose. All of these things were true. But after about 15 minutes of walking on the PCT, it was clear that I had never walked into desert mountains in early June with a pack that weighed significantly more than half of what I did strapped onto my back, which it turns out is not very much like walking at all, <laughs> which is in fact hell. <laughs> I began panting and sweating immediately, dust caking my boots and calves as the trail turned north and began to climb rather than undulate. Each step was a toil as I ascended higher and higher still, interrupted only by the occasional short descent which was not so much a break in the hell as it was a new kind of hell, because I had to brace myself against each step, lest gravity's pull cause me with my tremendous, uncontrollable weight to catapult forward and fall. I felt like the pack was not so much attached to me as me to it, like I was a building with limbs, unmoored from my foundation, careening through the wilderness. Within 40 minutes, the voice inside my head was screaming, what have I gotten myself into? I tried to ignore it, to hum as I hiked, though humming proved too difficult to do 
while also panting and moaning in agony <laughs> and trying to remain hunched in that remotely upright position while also propelling myself forward when I felt like a building with legs. So then I tried to simply concentrate on what I heard, my feet thudding against the dry and rocky trail, the brittle leaves and branches of the low-lying bushes I passed clattering in the hot wind. But it could not be done. The clamor of what have I gotten myself into was a mighty shout. It could not be drowned out. The only possible distraction was my vigilant search for rattlesnakes. I expected one around every bend, ready to strike. The landscape was made for them, it seemed, and also for mountain lions and wilderness-savvy serial killers. <laughs> but I wasn't thinking of them. It was a deal I'd made with myself months before, and the only thing that allowed me to hike alone. I knew that if I allowed my fear to overtake me, my journey was doomed. Fear, to a great extent, is born of a story we tell ourselves. And so I chose to tell myself a different story from the one women are told. I decided I was safe. I was strong. I was brave. Nothing could vanquish me. Insisting on this story was a form of mind control, but for the most part it worked. Every time I heard a sound of unknown origin or felt something horrible cohering in my imagination, I pushed it away. I simply did not let myself become afraid. Fear begets pe fear, power begets power. I willed myself to beget power, and it wasn't long before I actually wasn't afraid. I was working too hard to be afraid. Thanks. Thank you. So I was working too hard to be afraid. I was also working too hard to, um, to in some ways, get, get lost again in so many of the things that brought me out there. I went on the hike seeking spiritual redemption and emotional healing, and I got out there and I had a very physical experience. I imagined myself you know, doing that, that thing we imagine in, uh, in nature where it kind of has that soundtrack that you hear when you're getting a massage, you know? And um, it's all very lovely and the sunset. You, you never like imagine being swarmed by mosquitoes or, you know. But um, I got out there and I realized this is hard and, and, and I can do it. I can do this, even though it's really hard, and I'm going to keep doing it. And it was, it, it had this accumulation, accumulative power. People always say, well, what was the aha moment on the trail? Um, and there wasn't one. The aha moment was every humble, simple, ordinary day of continuing to move forward. And, and those things uh, have a way of building uh, on one another and um, equaling something much greater uh, than a single day. And, um, and, and that was really powerful to, to, to feel like, okay, I can do this even though I'm absolutely an idiot and there's no, I mean, I made all these, these mistakes um, as a backpacker and a human. Um, and, yet, and yet, you know, I also could then learn from them. I've always been somebody who learned best the hard way, like probably most of us. And so pushing myself outside that comfort, comfort zone physically, suffering physically, ended up being in some ways an enactment of that emotional suffering and, and, and really changing my life. And, and, and this isn't, a, I wanted to tell a st story of real transformation, not the Hollywood um, version of how we change. It wasn't as if I began the hike and I was like Charles Manson and then I ended and I was the Buddha, you know? Um, I was basically me. I was me all along. There was, there isn't a, there's a younger self, just like there is a younger self for all of you, but it's the same self, you know? You would have liked me Back then, you would have thought I was a little bit fucked up. You, you, you might still think I'm a little bit fucked up. Um, I sort of am, but uh, aren't we all, you know? And um, I was more so then, and I was sadder. It was harder. Um, and I sort of got myself, it, this, this hike allowed me to see my life more clearly again and to put things in perspective and not to, uh, you know, it was never that, um, there was this huge shift for me when it came to grieving my mom. Um, and that was this very simple thing of acceptance you know, just that she would always be dead, and that would always be hard for me and sad, and it wouldn't be the way I wanted it to be, but that I could, uh, you know, move on anyway. And um, so many of the most, I think, important things that we come to know are those really seemingly very simple things that end up being incredibly complex. So I did that, and, um, and I moved forward in my life. And one of the big things that while this, this journey gave me I think was a sense of resilience and discipline and faith in the kind of impossible. And you need that to be a writer. 
you need that in in droves <laughs> because um, that's the same. You you have to face that page every day, and so that really helped me write my first book, which was this novel, Torch, and um, and then I turned my attention to Wild and wrote Wild, and when I finished the first draft of Wild, I finished the the first big draft, um, February of 2010, and. As, uh, there was this moment in a writer's life, you send it off into the, the universe to your editor, and you're waiting for your editor to come back with all these notes saying, you know, all the things you need to change and fix and revise and reconsider and, you know, about your book. But there was this glorious mo sense of like, I have done this big thing, I have climbed this mountain. And into my inbox in this, in this ecstatic state, um, I got an email from the writer Steve Almond. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Steve Almond. He's fantastic, you should have him here, and if he comes, you should pack the room like this because he's um, a lot more handsome than me and a <laughs> lot funnier. Um, but he said, I'm doing this thing. I'm writing this column anonymously. It's an advice column called Dear Sugar, writing for this new website called The Rumpus. And I've been doing it intermittently. It doesn't pay anything. It doesn't really have a following. I'm not really interested in doing it. Would you like to take it over? <laughs> And since that essentially described my entire career up until very recently, um, I was like, sure, you know, I'll do that. And I didn't, I just sort of stumbled into it. I hadn't been a connoisseur of the advice column, and um, I had never even taken Psychology 101, um, nor gone to therapy myself, except for a couple times that I write about in Wild. Um, but I realized pretty quickly that, that essentially all my work as a writer had actually prepared me for this role, because what do writers do but pay really close attention to people and humans, to build a character or, or to even write the self on the page. You have to be willing to understand and see all the complexities and contradictions and to really take those things apart. Who are we really? Who are we really is the question of, of, of you know, all writers essentially. And so what happened with Sugar is these people were writing me these letters and I was getting this opportunity to write them back about what I thought about their situation. And I decided that I would not be bound by the form, that I was going to, to put everything into this, the whole force of my humanity and my, everything I knew as a, a writer. I was going to write um, really deeply into these things. And so I did. And, and um, they, those, I, I did it anonymously. I always knew that someday my name would be on them. Um, and I came out as Sugar last year, right before Wild came out on Valentine's Day in San Francisco. If you're going to come out anywhere, do it in San Francisco. <laughs> They'll accept you for whoever you are. Um, and I loved that, um, you know, experience of go, moving from, from being somebody nobody knew to being sugar as me. So I'm, and those columns were collected last summer into the collection Tiny Beautiful Things. N not all of the columns, but many of them. And so I thought I'd close tonight before we get to your questions. And please write your questions down if you have them. I thought I'd close with one of the shorter columns in the book. It's the title column called Tiny Beautiful Things. How many of you in here are familiar with sugar? Okay, so a lot of you, this is new. One of the challenges of Tiny Beautiful Things and the sugar column is most people say what I would have said if I had seen the book, and that is, um, well, I'm not interested in reading advice columns, you know? And, and this will give you a sense of that it's just a little different than Dear Abby. <laughs> if you haven't noticed that about me already. I don't think Dear Abby had Harley Davidson motorcycle boots, for example, but she would have looked awesome in them. Okay. Dear Sugar, I read your column religiously. I'm 22. From what I can tell by your writing, you're in your early 40s. My question is short and sweet. What would you tell your 20-something self if you could talk to her now? Love, Seeking Wisdom. Dear Seeking Wisdom, stop worrying about whether you're fat. You're not fat. Or rather, you're sometimes a little bit fat, but who gives a <laughs> There is, you guys are so fun. Um, there is nothing more boring and fruitless than a woman lamenting the fact that her stomach is round. Feed yourself, literally. The sort of people worthy of your love will love you more for this, sweet pea. In the middle of the night, in the middle of your 20s, when your best woman friend crawls naked into your bed, straddles you, and says, you should run away from me before I devour you, believe her.
You guys have had that friend too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you are not a terrible person for wanting to break up with someone you love. You don't need a reason to leave. Wanting to leave is enough. Leaving doesn't mean you're incapable of real love or that you'll never love anyone else again. It doesn't mean you're morally bankrupt or psychologically demented or a nymphomaniac. It means you wish to change the terms of one particular relationship. That's all. Be brave enough to break your own heart. When that really sweet but f***ed up gay couple invites you over to their cool apartment to do ecstasy with them, say no. <laughs> there are some things you can't understand yet. Your life will be a great and continuous unfolding. It's good you've worked hard to resolve childhood issues while in your 20s, but understand that what you resolve will need to be resolved again and again. You will come to know things that can only be known with the wisdom of age and the grace of years. Most of those things will have to do with forgiveness. One evening, you will be rolling around on the wooden floor of your apartment with a man who will tell you he doesn't have a condom. You will smile in this funky way that you think is hot and tell him to go ahead anyway. This will be a mistake for which you alone will pay. Don't lament so much about how your career is going to turn out. You don't have a career. You have a life. Do the work. Keep the faith. Be true blue. Keep writing and quit your bitching. Your book has a birthday. You don't know what it is yet. You cannot convince people to love you. This is an absolute rule. No one will ever give you love because you want him or her to give it. Real love moves freely in both directions. Don't waste your time on anything else. Most things will be okay eventually, but not everything will be. Sometimes you'll put up a good fight and lose. Sometimes you'll hold on really hard and realize there's no choice but to let go. Acceptance is a small, quiet room. One hot afternoon during the era in which you've gotten yourself ridiculously tangled up with heroin, you will be riding the bus and thinking what a worthless piece of crap you are when a little girl will get on the bus holding the strings of two purple balloons. She'll offer you one of the balloons, but you won't take it because you believe you no longer have a right to such tiny, beautiful things. You're wrong. You do. Your assumptions about the lives of others are in direct relation to your naive pomposity. Many people you believe to be rich are not rich. Many people you think have it easy worked hard for what they got. Many people who seem to be gliding right along have suffered and are suffering. Many people who appear to you to be old and stupidly saddled down with kids and cars and houses were once every bit as hip and pompous as you. When you meet a man in the doorway of a Mexican restaurant who later kisses you while explaining that this kiss doesn't mean anything because much as he likes you, he's not interested in having a relationship with you or anyone right now, just laugh and kiss him back. Your daughter will have his sense of humor. Your son will have his eyes. <laughs> the useless days will add up to something. The waitressing jobs, the hours writing in your journal, the long meandering walks, the reading poetry and story collections and novels and dead people's diaries and wondering about sex and God and whether you should shave under your arms or not. These things are your becoming. One Christmas, at the very beginning of your 20s, when your mother gives you a warm coat that she saved for months to buy, don't look at her skeptically after she tells you she thought the coat was perfect for you. Don't hold it up and say it's longer than you like your coats to be and too puffy and possibly even too warm. Your mother will be dead by spring. That coat will be the last gift she gave you. You will regret the small thing you didn't say for the rest of your life. Say thank you. Sugar. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
guys, do you guys see what I mean? He's just crying and crying at this advice. Okay, so um, Jan's gonna come around and grab questions and hand them off to me. And I, I will ask. Remember too that if you'd, okay. Remember too if, you, if you'd like to tweet your question, hashtag DMPL Avid. We're gonna kick it off with um, the question that every memoir writer is going to have to answer from here on out. It's the James Fry question. Other than names of people, are there any fictional parts to the book Wild? Right, I changed, um, is my mic not on? Hello? Okay. Right, uh, essentially, in the, as I said in the author's note, I changed the names of some of the people in the book and others not, and my criteria for that was, you know, if I could ask somebody, do you want me to use your real name or make up a name, um, I did that. And that's, you know, a really common practice in memoir writing, and I don't see it as so much a fictional device as a one that allows people to protect their privacy, you know, if they don't want to be um, like, yeah, that's me in the book. And of course, most people actually, if I asked them, they said yes, but um, some people were like, oh, they're a little shy, or, you know, so, so there was that shield of privacy. I didn't create any composite characters. Everyone in the book is... Um, an actual person uh, who I met on the trail and is, you know, what I wrote about them is the way I perceive them. Um, and, and there, I think, is where um, memoir steps in and gets complicated for people. Because, um, you know, in memoir, you are certainly, in my case, I, I'm certainly striving for fairness, but, I'm, but I'm, uh, my main allegiance is subjectivity. And by that, I mean, um, I'm telling the story, you know, deeply from my perspective. Um, nobody has, nobody in the book has complained about uh, what I wrote about them, uh, which I think is really uh, amazing, except for one person, okay? And he had a tiny quibble. It's, it's uh, this man who I actually wrote very nicely about. It. He and his wife took me in and let me take a shower and gave me a sandwich. And I wrote about essentially how I kind of wanted them to be like my parents. And um, he said, you made us seem really bourgeois. And... Um, <laughs> And he was like upset. And then I had to write him back and say, well, here's the thing, is that's what I thought of you. You know, I, you have to remember who I was. I was this 20 something punk who, yeah, anyone who had like a nice summer cabin and you know, um, you know organic uh, Havarti in the refrigerator was bourgeois, you know? And I was like, and if, if it's any comfort, a whole bunch of 20 somethings would come to my house and see me in that way too. It wasn't a judgment, it was um, who I was then looking at who they were then, you know, to, to me. And so the other piece of it is in memoir, what you're doing is you're creating you know, these, these, a story based, this, these were actual things that happened to me objectively. Um, and I want to tell you vividly the story as I remember it. And so what that entails is me actually telling you like the way that the grandmother on the porch would tell you the way she remembers this, this story. And so, you know, if I say that the wind blew the, the, his, this man's hair across his face as he said this to me, if there were a camera there, would the wind have blown his hair across his face at that moment? I do not know. But I do know that that's how I remember it. And so that's how I felt free to write about it with a sort of authority of, you know, step closer, I'm gonna tell you about this, this experience. I'm gonna move forward so you guys can see me. I guess there's people all around, so it doesn't matter, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna shoot through a couple of short ones here and see. My feet are okay, that's the number one question. Oh, oh all right. We got that out of the way. It um, took a while for them to be okay, but they're okay. Okay, um, this, is, this is a quickie. How do you do heroin and not get hooked? Um, well, I mean, I think like any, I mean, uh, like any drug, and, and, I, and I certainly don't recommend, you know, like trying this to see if you get addicted. Um, <laughs> but um, like anything, I mean, I, I think that often when we, we talk about drugs, we're like, oh my God, you use it once and you're immediately an addict. I've used pretty much every kind of drug there is and, and, and never got addicted. Um, but certainly with heroin, I was becoming, you know, I was becoming addicted and I was pulled away at that moment um, that it was essentially still possible for me. It was before I had developed a physical addiction. And so then it became this thing, essentially it was like recreational use that was, you know, really not very fun. It was actually a very, um, like I said, it led to really horrible things in my life, you know. But um, I didn't, I didn't do it 
enough over a long enough period to get addicted. And I also just was lucky enough that I wasn't one of those people who used, you know, like there were there was like a couple months where I was using it very regularly. And some people would have that experience and go completely down the rabbit hole of addiction. Like my ex-boyfriend did, the guy I write about in the book who I call Joe. Um, he, you know, was a, a heroin addict for seven years after that um, time that I met him. He had just started using when I met him. So it is one of those things that, you know, you can use certain drugs and not become an addict, but that doesn't mean um, you, you want to test that theory, you know. Any contact with the three young bucks? Oh, the three young bucks, yeah. Well, Rick, the guy, the, 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 the buck that I had the, you know, almost, um, you know, thing with, um, he became my, he's a dear friend of mine. And, th and those bucks, that those are their real names. They were, they were among the people who were like, yeah, you can use our real names. Um, <laughs> and so it was so funny. Rick, what happened is we became good friends. And I met my, the man who's now my husband nine days after I finished my hike. So by the time Rick got to Portland after his hike, he called me up and we went out a few times. But I was dating Brian, who then I married like four years later. Um, so... Rick and I just, you know, became friends. And so all these years later, I'm writing this scene about our, my attraction to him and my perceived, my perception of his attraction to me and, you know, lying in the back of that pickup truck and everything. And he's, I didn't vet the book with anyone, but he's the one person that I thought, oh my God, what if I'm completely mistaken about this? <laughs> And, and he's like, you know, Cheryl, I didn't feel that way at all. And in fact, I'm gay. You know, I, I would just... <laughs> I would just be mortified, you know? So I said, Rick, this is so embarrassing. Um, but did you have any, you know, feelings for me um, back in 1995 when we met? And he emailed me back immediately. And it was one of those things where, you know, you get this, like, long email. And he's like, oh, my God. And he's, like, step by step, you know, tortured. Like, and um, he remembered everything, you know, exactly uh, the way I remembered it. And he was like, why didn't you kiss me? I never understood, you know. And so we processed it all these years later. My husband was highly amused. Um, <laughs> Highly not amused. Um, but so we're friends. And then Richie, um, who's the other, one of the other young bucks, he's truly one of the most unique people I've ever met in my life. If you go on my website and there's a picture of a man who's holding a rattlesnake, that's Richie. And that's a wild rattlesnake. Every snake they encountered um, he, on the trail, he would charm it and pick it up. And he lives in New Orleans. He grew up in New Orleans. And um, he stayed there through Katrina and saved people's lives and was written about in the New York Times. He said, there's a quote of him saying th something like, I'm staying as long as the weed doesn't run out. Um, so, that's a, <laughs> so that tells you Richie. But he wrote me a letter. He doesn't have email. That's how weird he is. And he wrote me an actual letter. And he said, I just want to thank you for portraying us so accurately um, in Wild. He's like, when I think of myself back then, I think of myself as a, as a handsome and studly man, too. So... Uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, the Iowans are dying to know, while I know finances were tight, I wonder why you just didn't take one credit card, just in case. Nobody would give me a credit card, I don't think. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, th this was just, yeah, no, actually, all my credit cards had been, you know, we, I would, had always been broke, and I had this huge financial, or student loan debt. I paid off my bachelor's degree, I turned 44 in September, on my birthday. I paid off my bachelor's degree, my student loans. Um, so, thank you. Yeah, all those years I was paying uh, this mountain of debt, and um, and I just didn't. Nobody would give me a credit card. Would you have given me a credit card? I, um, <laughs> I have to say I would not. But I do really <laughs> like the book. Thank you. Ellen and Joyce would like to let you know that uh, if you're in town tomorrow, um, you can hike Brown's Woods, and they'll meet you out there. Oh. I wish, I, I'm going to say it, Liz. One thing I want to say about the money thing um, oh. that I think is really kind of important is a lot of times people will say, well, why didn't you take more money? You know, as if I had some secret account that I just didn't want to tap into. And, um, <laughs> you know, I took all the money I had. And one of the, the great liberations of growing up the way I did, you know, I always had this kind of chip on my shoulder, to be, to be honest, um, about, you know, when I went to college, I had all these peers whose parents were paying for their education or who bought them a car or, you know, did what all those nice things that parents can do when they can afford to do that. And 
I had never gotten a lesson in anything or gone to camp or had any, any of that stuff in my childhood. And I, and I felt really deprived about it and kind of angry. And when I was on the PCT, I realized that, you know, having grown up the way I did, what it, what it gave me was actually the ability to, um, to have confidence that I could move freely through the world and do what I wanted to do without um, needing money to give me permission to do it. And also that I didn't need as big of a cushion as um, is recommended, you know? I didn't need a cushion at all. And the way I knew that as I watched my mom uh, um, do this, you know, this whole thing, my whole childhood without a cushion. And so it gave me actually a sense of, of freedom and, and resilience and, I, you know, can do this. And I did have enough money because I did the trip, right? I just didn't have enough money to get everything I wanted. Um, and sometimes having not enough money made me uncomfortable and, and, you know, I was full of longing. But I got to do what I wanted to do in a bigger way. So I had plenty of money. And less debt. And less debt. Well, yeah, I, I was already so screwed with the student loans. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't those credit cards. Um, okay, this is from Twitter. Hashtag BMPL. Um, is hiking the PCT Volume 1 still in print? Did sales of the guidebook shoot up as your book rose in popularity? <laughs> they did. They, they sold out of the guidebook. Um, actually, they had to go back to print and all these things. Um, and it's, so it's, it, the Pacific Crest Trail Volume 1 California um, now has been broken up into two volumes. California is so big that now it's Volume 1, Volume 2. And there's also you know, the Volume 3 and 4 in the states of Oregon and Washington. And they do still exist, and there's still the Bible of the trail. Everyone who hikes the PCT buys that book from that press, Wilderness Press. And many, many, many people have gone and bought um, the book because of Wild. And I think, I, I know that I've um, helped a lot of people lose a lot of toenails um, because they have, they have written to me and told me about their adventures. It's gross. Yeah. <laughs> it hurts to lose a toenail. Um, someone would like to let you know that there was a question on Jeopardy today um, about Wild and the PCT. I know, I know. So, so this cool. is it. I have finally made it. Yeah, on Jeopardy. <laughs> the question was, um, you know, something like, in, in, in Cheryl Strayed's Wild, um, what, what trail is, you know, chronicled or whatever? And the person got it wrong. <laughs> they probably said something lame like the Appalachian Trail. But yeah, all these people, I got all these emails that I was on Jeopardy. I was like, oh my God, that's really exciting to me. All right, this is an easy one. Who do you think took all your condoms? Oh, I know. <laughs> you know, that, that has yet to be determined. And what's funny, so Ed, those of you who've read the book, Ed the Trail Angel, who, um, you know, was at the Kennedy Meadows camp where I dumped those condoms. He's the, kind of like the latest suspect. Somebody suggested him to me. I had written him off. But what's funny is I, met, I ran into Ed again. I was on my book tour last summer and I was in Los Angeles and there was this elderly gentleman in the front row. And every time I kind of glanced up, he would, you know, in the middle of my reading and he would make this, these, you know, animated gestures with his face. And until I finally just stopped the reading and was like, what do you want? You know, who? And, and he said, Cheryl, it's Ed. And it was Ed, who I had not seen, you know, all those, for all those years. And he opens up his bag, and he pulls out um, my foldable saw that I had dumped at the... I had brought a saw, you know, just in case I wanted to cut down any trees or anything um, <laughs> along the way. And um, so he said... <laughs> He gave it to me, and I was like, oh my gosh, it's my say. He goes, I've had it all these years. Every time I look at it, I think of you. And, um, and he gave it to me, and then I realized, well, I'm on my book tour, and I was only taking carry-on, and the TSA won't let you take a saw. <laughs> um, so I had to give it back to him. It's probably for sale on eBay now, but um, yeah, he, he has my saw still. He didn't take out the condoms. If he took them, he's, he, might, he used them long ago. Not good anymore. So I mean. Well, so, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. Okay. I, I like this one. Did you ever find out or see your interview in the Hobo magazine? No. You know, and I searched for it. Turns out the hobos are really bad at archiving. Um, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> I find that inexcusable. <laughs> So, um, somebody... I think, this, I think that needs to be an order of business at the Hobo <laughs> Convention in Brit this year, if we could get that on the docket. So, but I, I, I looked, I looked, um, when I was, 
when I was um, writing the book and didn't find anything. And in fact, didn't even find, like, you know, I did find an excerpt in Harper's from the Hobo Times, but, but couldn't really ever definitively find, like, if the paper still exists or whatever. So who knows? Who knows who that joker was? Well, we have a yearly hobo convention in Britt, Iowa, if you ever want to. Are you serious? I am serious. You should oh visit. Oh, my gosh. You could speak there. I should go and read the hobo pack, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the passage from You're the, like a hobo star. Would they them. like me or would they be offended? They would no, love I think you. They, okay, yeah. they would love you. Okay, I, I love these questions, and I'm going to kind of merge them, not because they're not great in their own right, but um, for the, in the interest of time. Um, these are from Twitter. Will you ever hike the trail again, maybe with your children when they're older? Um, and also, yes, the answer is yes. Have you hiked with your family? And if so, what did that feel like? Yes, I've done both of those things. And we hike all the time. My kids are seven and eight, so we haven't really gone backpacking. We're going to do that this summer. It, it's just hard to, to really go into the you know, backwoods with little kids. Because um, with little kids, like every day is like camping, you know? Um, <laughs> Like, you go to the grocery store, you've got to pack so much gear. It's, like, amazing. But, um, uh, but um, we, we hike, and it's really great. And I want to say to any of you who have little kids, um, to just encourage you to get your kids out there. Like, my kids, what they always do is, like, oh, we don't want to hike. And, they're, they, you know, they're, they're complaining and whining. And then the minute we get out there, they just go into that other mode where they're exploring and running around and throwing rocks in the creek. And it's a wonderful thing. Um, and so we, we, I would love to do the whole trail with my family. Once they, my husband and I think that there's going to be this magic moment. Our kids are 18 months apart. So they're going to be like this magic moment where they've, they're strong enough and big enough and old enough to go backpacking, but they haven't yet fallen off into the surly teenage years. And um, so there was going to be like this two-week period where we can get them <laughs> you know, out there. <laughs> The, the other downside of hiking with really young children is that they're also known as prey. So that's right, like that's right. So helpless. <laughs> um, okay. You know, uh, just for, there are a lot of writing questions, and um, I'll, sort of, I'll sort of merge them all together. Um, all of my best writing advice is in Tiny Beautiful Things in the column called Write Like a Mother. I just want you to know I bought a shirt that says that, yeah. and it was, um, and it hasn't arrived in the mail. So if you could get in touch with them, yeah, I'd, totally I'd not my department, that. but you know, I I'll tell them. That. I'll tell them. <laughs> Shoot off an email. All right. Um, in Wild, I found the horse scene especially excruciating to imagine. It was so very sad. What was it like to write it? And in a bigger picture, what's it like to write? in a, such a wide open manner? Right. I mean, you have to just be sweating and exhausted on the floor at night when you shut the computer. Yeah, the, so the scene um, about my mother's horse, Lady, um, the, you know, that's absolutely the worst thing that I've ever written and the worst thing I've ever lived through. And I hope I never have to write a scene like that again. I didn't want to write it. I didn't know I was going to have it in the book until I was deep into the book, and then I realized, my goodness, you know, it was, well, I think, one of the most important scenes in the book. And um, it was really harrowing to write it. I, I, you know, when you, when you write and you, when you're writing, you really have to enter the moment. And so I went back to that place. And actually, I, I had come to Minnesota, I'd come back to Minnesota. I live in Portland, Oregon. And I'd come to northern Minnesota um, to spend five days by myself in a cabin um, on actually the road where I grew up, about 20 miles down the road from where I grew up. And um, I, get, I got into the cabin. It was this old, um, it used to be a, a Catholic uh, sort of retreat center. And um, I'd heard about it growing up. It was built when I was a teenager. And I didn't realize until I walked into the, the door of this cabin that my stepfather had built it. My stepfather was a carpenter. And when I was a teenager, I remember him saying, oh, I'm building this thing for this, these nuns. And I get there, and I know it's my stepfather built it because he has a very distinctive style of carpentry um, that is recognizable in a flash, and especially to me. Um, it looked just like my house, really. And so I sat in that cabin for five days, and I wrote that scene over and over and over and over again. And I wept and wept, and I would write, and then I would bundle up and go walking in the snow and, um, and come back and write some more. And I read it out loud to myself over and over and over again, because I wanted to get every sing I mean, I wanted to get every word right in Olive Wild, but in that scene, I wanted to get every single word right. And it's really hard to write a scene that brutal um, and also that emotionally intense because, um, you know, it's hard to convey this, the, the 
you know, just all of that emotion without becoming melodramatic. And so I just wrote it um, uh, with, with everything in me. It was horrible. And I'm sorry for the scene. You know, if I were a reader coming upon that scene, it would be a scene I would want to skip over because I hate to read stuff like that. And yet it was necessary. So I hope you'll forgive me for including it. Do you always read your work out loud? Always. Mm -hmm. um, could you share about choosing your last name? Okay. So yeah, when I was married young, too young, it turns out. Um, and um, so when we got divorced, I just knew that I wasn't, I couldn't go back to being Cheryl Nyland. Um, that, that's my name growing up. Nyland is, you know, still my middle name. I just bumped it over a spot. But um, I, I was just, you know, I was at this moment where really, like I said, I was an orphan and I didn't have a mother or father. My family disintegrated after my mom died and I was getting divorced. Everything was ending and everything was beginning. And you know, as somebody, somebody who really has, um, you know, such a uh, relationship with words, like I knew I had to choose a word for myself that would be, uh, that would become, I guess, my heritage, you know, that I created. And, and so I, I thought of the word strayed. And now that's been my name. Sometimes when people will go, well, straight isn't your real name. But it actually is my real name. It's my real legal name. And it's just every bit as, you know, women take on men's names all the time. It's, this is no less real than that. It was just um, something I made up myself. And um, it feels like, you know, my name. It, it's, it's been my name a long time now. 18 years. Solid, yeah. It, it, it's, Thanks. It's official now. It right? works, yeah. yeah. Okay. While fielding many questions in writing, Dear Sugar, and now interviews, is there a question you wish someone would ask you? And then I will ask it to you. you can whisper. Would you like a piece of pie? <laughs> Why, yes, thank you. you, you. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't help you with that. <laughs> I feel like you've given so much, and now I can't give anything Damn. back. Damn. Okay, real quick. I, you guys are supposed to be like the pie capital, right? Where's the pie? We are the awesome capital. <laughs> um, okay, just real, can you shotgun um, three okay. book recommendations to us? Or, or auth and authors. Running. Away to Home. Away to Home. By St. Martin's Press. <laughs> By this fabulous, fabulous woman. No shilling, no shilling. Go ahead. Um, okay, okay. See, this always happens to me that my mind goes completely, you know, utterly blank. Um, Sharon Olds just won the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry for her collection Stag's Leap, which is extraordinary. Um, I think, I, I love that, I love that book. Um, and uh, my, uh, a colleague in my writer's group, Monica Drake, her novel, The Stud Book, just came out last week and it's fantastic. That's the best name ever. <laughs> The stud the book? The stud book, yes, yes. All right, one more? One more? Yep, please. Oh, I gave you three books. Yours, oh, Sharon Olds. Oh, thank you. Okay, but I'll give you, I'll give you another one. Um, my, my rumpus colleague is in the room, Brian Spears. There he is, over there. He's the poetry editor of the rumpus. And he lives right here in your fair city. And um, he is also a fine poet, and I, I recommend that you buy all of his, everything he's ever written. <laughs> all, all of right, his we're volumes. we're going to get right on that. Uh, everybody take out check out these books and uh, love listening to those kind of answers. Um, we've got a, you know, it, it, there's a lot of family-oriented questions here. And I think the one that's the most interesting to me is that you were very candid in, um, in your book about sex. Did you, did you ever worry about how this might affect your children or, or, or when they read it in the future? Um, you know, we all have the moms we have, and the mom that my kids have is me. I'm a writer, and so that's the work I do. Is I, like I said, I write about the human condition, and sometimes in fiction, and sometimes in nonfiction. And so my kids, first of all, have grown up, kind of, you know, this is this is the the atmosphere in which they've come into the world. And and it's not as if for their 16th birthday, I'm going to wrap up all my books and be like, time to get to know mommy better, guys. You know, um, I th I think my kids will come to my work when they're ready to. Um, probably well into their adulthood, they'll probably skim things and be mortified at certain points and annoyed and, you know, all of those things that, that, like I said earlier, we don't like to think of our parents as full human beings who are, have their own lives. But I trust, too, that my kids will um, one day recognize what a 
profound gifts they have. And I mean, how, wouldn't you all love to have a bunch of books that your parents wrote about who they were before you came along and after too, like who they really are inside? And so I think that someday my kids will be able to stand back and see that and it will be a gift um, to them. And they can skim over the sex scenes. That's fine with me. My but brother did. My brother loved Sharpie. Wild. Just take and a Sharpie. He said, you know, Cheryl, the only thing, like, when you get to Ashland with that, like, hippie guy, he's like, I just kind of skimmed over that. And I was like, that's totally fine. You're my brother, you know? So that's fine. All right. Um, I'm being told by Jan. She's very firm about this. Did, uh, one more question. So did the book say everything you wanted to say, or is there anything you would like to add for us tonight? The book said everything I wanted it to say in like a in a big way. I mean, there, the thing is, there are certainly scenes in the book. In in the by the book, you mean Wild, right. I guess. Um, there are certainly things in any in the process of making a a book of any sort. Um, you know, some things you have to. Uh, leave out for, you know, the sake of not repeating yourself for concision or whatever. And so there are some things that I feel like um, there's like funny moments or, oh, you know, outtakes that, that would be like, maybe there's, there will someday be like the director's cut of, of Wild or something. But, you know, I, I think everything that's necessary for the book is in there. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Cheryl one more time for coming. Thank you thank for you. your candid answers.